Hey everyone, welcome to another live stream, a little happy hour. Uh, today it's only me. Um, sorry if you uh, were enjoying all the guests, but I'm sure I'll have more guests <laughs> in the future. Um, thanks for joining me. We got people from all over the place, it looks like. Um, Chile, the UK, Utah, California. I mean, pretty awesome that you're all here to hang out. And uh, so it's just me. I'm going to try to keep over some chat. Um, <clears throat> but uh, yeah, welcome to another happy hour. Today's a, a pretty cool one. It's going to be, uh, I think it's going to be a good time. Um, I'm doing something a little different. I'm going to do a live, a live generation you could say of a twin motion scene so basically you're going to see how to use twin motion with revit from scratch but the trick here is that i'm actually going to be using someone else's model so um before i jump into it if you haven't done so already please uh make sure you subscribe to my youtube channel i think i only need like four or five hundred more and we'll hit thirty thousand, which is really really cool so please do that and um the other thing is um if you are interested in um my new community platform. Um, so we just did a beta launch last week. If you if you joined me last week, you probably knew about it. Um, and so that's closed for now, but uh, we'll be building it and launching it again in the future. And so um, actually this model that I'm using is directly from a member, a conversation that I had with a member within the BIM After Dark community. But if you are interested in that and want to know more about it, definitely check out bimafterdarkbeta.com and you can sign up to be on the email list for the next time I do a beta or public release for, for the BIM After Dark community. And that's just a community where I have um, a social media type of platform for all the community to chat with me and others, um, as well as um, courses and live office hours kind of like this, except you guys also have interaction with me uh, beyond just chat, uh, which is pretty cool. So uh, so the story goes, uh, Mike, who is a member of BIM After Dark, thanks Mike, uh, I'm assuming you're here if you are. Thanks for joining and thanks for uh, um, wanting to share. And so the story basically goes, um, uh, Mike asked a question about um, when, um, when, do, when do you choose or, or, or who has chosen outsourcing renderings versus building the models, designing, et cetera. So essentially what Mike was asking was, um, at some point he either feels like he doesn't have time to produce the renderings or he feels like um, the architecture gets pushed aside to do more um, visual visual arts. And, and then he's uh, a great uh, quote that Mike had was when he's doing interior renderings, he feels like in order to make them look good, he almost has to become a decorator more than an architect. And so uh, we had a great conversation within the community about this. Um, everyone sort of had opinions. And what I thought would be great is, because my opinion on it, um, I have a few opinions on it. And uh, one of them was um, at this point in time, we have so many great tools that it doesn't have to be a burden anymore. Um, yeah, there's a certain level of detail that may be required for something like interiors, but um, creating renderings does not have to be a burden anymore. It can be the part of the process or just a, a, um, an easier um, process and less time consuming process. So I thought it'd be kind of fun, um, given that I've been focusing on these real-time rendering engines recently, and uh, I've been sort of uh, putting Twin Motion 2020 through the through the ringer. Um, I'm testing it out on some crazy things to see um, where I can break it, and um, I'll tell you right now, I have broke it many times. <laughs> but um, and so I said, why don't you send me the model, and um, and uh, I will do some sort of like I'm doing now, either a live stream or record myself doing it, and just see how long it takes me to take your model and um, turn it into a live, um, fully rendered. Um, real-time scene essentially um, so basically making image renderings but what's really cool is because i'm doing it into in motion it's a live scene and so you'll you'll see that as i go through um, i am going to try and sort of crank through it because um, um i don't know how long this is going to take i i'm pretty sure i can get this done in under an hour um, but I am going to check chats as I go along and I'm going to narrate as I go through for those of you who are interested in the process to, of twin motion and so on and so forth. Um, so feel free to chit chat on, on, on the stream. Um, I'm going to keep an eye on it as I go through and I'm also going to walk through some of the steps. So, uh, with that being said, uh, I'm going to jump right in and sort of talk about the model that was there and, um, some of the things that, um, that I noticed right away that I had to sort of modify, um, before I bring it into twin motion. So. All right, Konnichiwa from Tokyo. Hey, Tokyo, cool man. Nice to uh, nice to meet you. Thanks for joining us. <clears throat> I actually, uh, for those of you who 
uh, have followed me over time, you know that I am uh, uh, pretty pretty big into um, largemouth bass fishing and bass fishing in general. But I started with trout fishing now just because of my location. I sort of converted to, to bass fishing. And uh, I stumbled upon a few um, videos of, of folks over in Japan uh, bass fishing and, and that sort of culture that exists over there. And it's it's wild. It's been... Uh, it's been a little uh, consuming a little bit of my time watching uh, Japanese bass fishing videos. <laughs> um, all right, I digress. So what you're seeing here is the model that Mike sent me. And so um, this model, uh, it's, it's a pretty cool example because it's, it's, I mean, I would say it's kind of a, 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 an example that a lot of you may be familiar with. You know, it's a single family residential house. It's not necessarily a crazy um, contemporary building. It's got a little bit of a contemporary flair to it, but you know, it's obviously a little more traditional, um, you know, gabled roofs and so on and so forth. And so, um, Mike sent me this model and, uh, it has basically everything you would want. He Mike, Mike created, um, the topography that you see here. Um, he created the, uh, the, uh, all the walls, everything you see here. The only thing that I did, and this is why I wanted to sort of start and rev it is, um, if you notice, I actually have, um, sub regions. And so, um, Mike had this road, Oops, this road here, and um, and that was it. So we had grass and the road. And what I did here is I made two subregions, uh, or actually three, I guess, if you use this side. And so what these subregions are going to do is, and this is a this is a strictly twin motion thing. Um, twin motion has an awesome um, twin motion 2020, I should say, has an awesome um, uh, technique tool, I guess. I don't know what to call it, tool, I guess, um, called veg vegetation scatter. And so what that allows you to do is actually take vegetation families or libraries in this case or objects and they scatter them throughout a surface um, based on a material. And so knowing that, if you look at the scene, it's actually a pretty big topo. Um, I, I made one subregion that's for grass. So this is for what I'm gonna call realistic grass. So I can use this smaller subregion to um, place 3D grass, and you'll see what I mean when I get into twin motion. If I did the entire topo for grass, um, it's a ton of grass that you don't need, right? We only really need grass within this this general location, so that's why I did that one subregion. And then the subregion back here is for trees, because I I don't know anything about where this site is, but I'm sort of making it in a rural sort of farmland hilly place. I mean, it is it is a pretty hilly hilly looking thing here, you know. Um, so, so I added these two subregions and I named them, uh, this one's called new grass, this one's called tree line, and then the original one is called site grass, and then down here is called asphalt. So that's one of the first things I did. Um, and this is a ve very much a twin motion thing. Um, I could have used um, paint, painting the, the trees on, which I'll show you as well, because I'm gonna do some of that. But um, just as a, a rule of thumb, um, if you're gonna use vegetation scatter, um, through Revit Topo, you might want to start subreging it because it's trying to scatter it across the entire surface, and what you'll see is that it, it, it becomes a lot, right? Um, so, that, so I added subregions, gave them names, and the only other thing I did, <clears throat> and um, this is something that is purely preference, but you'll notice that there's uh, sort of two lines going on with the standing seam. So this is a standing seam metal roof, and uh, just by looking at it and the fact that I'm rendering it, I knew that um, using a material to show standing seam isn't always the best case. So what I did is I quickly created um, standing seam metal roof using a technique that I've been using for I don't even know how many years now. Um, I should actually check to see right now how long I, I've, uh, I've been using this for. But uh, basically the technique, and I'll post it in the, in the chat right now. Look at that, 2013, wow. So I guess I've been doing this for a while now, this standing seam. So basically what you do, and I just posted the blog post in the chat, but what you do is you take all these roofs. Um, so I took all of these pitched roofs that you see here. I'm gonna select all. Okay, so let's just say I'm gonna use these two as an example. And you basically copy, you paste them in place, um, and then you convert them to a sloped glazing. And so I only have one type in here, but you probably would have one called curtain wall one. And once you uh, convert them to sloped glazing, uh, you can do something as simple, and I'll, I'll isolate it now. You can see that. So basically, it's a sloped glazing um, that has an empty system panel, and then it just has a grid distance. I did one foot two inches, so 14 inches, just because it looked pretty good on this scene, and then a, a using a mullion as the actual standing seam. 
The only this is not something you have to do. You can easily use a material, but in my humble opinion, if you're going to do standing seam and you're going to be creating renderings, um, it just looks a million times better when you have physical seams there, and these are really easy to create. So. So Mike, thanks for sharing the model. Um, the materials were perfect. I didn't touch any materials. Um, everything else looked pretty good. So pretty awesome that um, um, I can start with something like this and start rolling. But those are the, those are the only modifications I made. So I added two two or three subregions, and then I added a, a standing seam meta roof, and that's just preference. I think it just looks so much better. I guess I could have just um, made it uh, a shingled roof or something like that, but whatever. <laughs> it is what it is. So now that we have this model here. All I have to do is go to my Twin Motion tab, which is my exporter that I have plug uh, my exporter plugin. I'm going to leave these as is. Um, <clears throat> if you uh, if you look at some of these, I, I don't remember if this is default or not. Uh, I think some of these checkboxes are off by default, but I don't really care about MEP families. I guess I could turn this on and off. Doesn't really make a di big difference. Um, and then I sort of leave these as defaults. When you bring them into Twin Motion, you can have some some options, anyways. Oops. Hit the wrong button there. Okay, so there's my my export. So I'm going to use that export, and now I'm going to hop over to Twin Motion. Now we're starting from scratch. So someone else's model is rendering. So as long as the materials look good, and I flipped through it pretty quickly, you did a pretty good job. You'll see um, when I'm applying materials, there may be some that that you notice. Um, uh, maybe we should have done multiple materials too, or something like that. But either way, brand new scene, Twin Motion. Let's roll. First thing always with Twin Motion is make sure you save. Save immediately, save all the time. Reason being, the damn thing crashes. <laughs> um, usually it doesn't crash right away, um, and usually it's only on the bigger models, and it's for ran random reasons, but uh, you can't expect some crashes. It's just going to happen. Um, I'm hoping that over time there's less. I could tell you in 2019, which um, had many updates, it was near not. It did not crash nearly as much, and so I'm just hoping that some of these fix. But just be ready for some crashes. So I'm gonna save this thing right away. For now, I'm just gonna save it to my desktop. Happy Hour House Live. Okay, so first thing we do is set. Now, similar to Revit, when you start a brand new Revit project, the first thing that I like to do is I wanna set the location um, and set some of those sort of general settings that are gonna set the scene. <clears throat> so I'm going to first go to my background and I'm gonna change this thing to a countryside because why not? And I'm gonna import my um, I'm gonna import my model so that I can set my sun settings right away. I like to have my my sun settings and my visual settings in the working mode, which is kind of what we're seeing here, the build mode, you could say the editor mode, similar to what I'm gonna render at, so that I get a sense of shadows and tree placement and stuff like that, especially on a sort of fictitious scene like this. Um, so what we're gonna do right now is we're gonna import. So I'm going under my import tab here. I'm gonna go find my file. Click open. Now when you're using Revit with Twin Motion, um, I like to collapse by material. You could collapse by keep hierarchy, which if you export it by family, it would be. Not necessarily the greatest idea. Um, collapsing by material lets you change by material based on names, which is super awesome. But I do like to check this box that says fix UV texture. Um, so one thing you'll notice, especially with site work and some, some more, um, Oh, you know what? My head is in the way, huh? Sorry about that, guys. Let's see. Where can I move my head where it's out of the way a little bit? I hope you guys are seeing my head move live because that'd be pretty fun. Um, so I, I might just, I either gonna hide, I'm either gonna hide my head or I'm just gonna move myself around, we'll see. <laughs> okay, so I used over on the bottom left here is where I was talking about the tabs. So either way, what you wanna do is you wanna check the box that says fix UV texture. Um, mainly because it usually helps with trying to orient textures based on your um, on your your direction of your polygons that come out of Revit, and click OK. Now, if I look around, you could see I've got my model here, and there's this weird blank thing in the way. So if I pull up my tab, you could see every single scene with with Lumia um, with Twin Motion has a starting ground. So we're actually just going to delete the starting ground. We're not going to use the starting ground for this. And there we go. There, there is. My beautiful scene with all the textures not really applied okay so the reason I like to do this right away <clears throat> is um, now I have a sort of general idea of where this is oriented ideally you don't want to move Revit models when they come into twin motion um, because uh, 
it can be a pain in the butt to realign things afterwards. You can do it, but it's just a pain in the butt. So I, I ideally, if you can, make sure everything just comes in in the location and stays stays as is. So now let's go down to um, our little button down here, which is um, our settings. And I'm gonna set the location. So if I wanted to, I could set a location somewhere near me. So I could say something like Connecticut. Doesn't really matter, but I'm just gonna do Connecticut, USA. And where did it put me? Silver Lake, put me in Meriden, Connecticut. Okay, whatever. So we're in Meriden, Connecticut. That's not near me, but so we're in Meriden, Connecticut. And what I like to do is I like to kind of set um, sun settings with with where I may be. So I'm gonna think maybe an August sun, um, and then I'm gonna do a a north offset of something like maybe this for now. You know, my 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 image may be something more along the lines of of down here, right? So I wanna, I wanna set up my settings so that the shadows are kind of what I'm gonna want them to be for the final rendering. So that looks like a pretty good one there um, for, the, for the final rendering. Uh, background we already set. The other thing I like to do, so when you're, when you're creating images in twin motion, you can actually, in 2020 at least, you can actually set your lighting, your filters, your, your contrast, all of the stuff that you might want to apply to your images when you export, you can set those for the most part in the editor. So I like to do those right off the bat. So if for some reason you wanted um, to be a little more cloudy, so you can see here, I'm going to add a few more clouds. Maybe I want it to be, oh, look at that, the background changes to fall. How cool. Maybe I want to pull it a little bit to fall just so you get a little bit of green there, whatever. Um, the tree growth we won't worry about right now. Under effects, I can turn up things like smog if I want. I guess that really doesn't make a difference on this scene. So I'm just kind of setting these general ideas. And, and this is, remember, this is for my working view. But what's really cool about it is once I set them up, it makes my image creation much, much faster. So I'm gonna go under lighting and uh, I might tweak the exposure a little bit, maybe make it a little warmer. Um, shadows. Shadows are going to be harder to figure out because uh, the shadows have a lot to do with the distance where your camera is. So you may want to do those individually um, based on your your camera location. But um, but what I'll do here usually is just set a set a pretty big distance so I get to see all my shadows. And then I'll go in and look at some things like if I want to modify the ambient light. And remember, all of this is just the global settings. We're going to have the ability to change these per image if we want to. So if someone just asked the question, can you change the if you change the north offset? Uh, we lose the real north shadows and for that specific image or that specific work zone you will but you have the ability to modify these per image so you can flip it back to zero and do real shadows in your real images if you want um, so now i'm going to go into camera and uh, some of these things you definitely don't want parallelism on while you're working because then you'll get things that look like that which drives me nuts um, and then visual effects Again, these are sort of things that um, I will apply to my images, but I wanted to show you here that you can you can do them ahead of time. So a few things that I like to do is in color gradient, um, I do like um, the filter DT7. It just kind of smooths everything out and makes it a little warmer. Um, I'm a big fan of upping contrast and low in saturation. Again, all this stuff can be refined later, but I like to try and do it in the in the um, in this building mode. And then the last filter I like to add is called line light. So line light, let me do this. If I go to line regular, you can see what line regular is doing. It's actually adding an outline to your images. Line light, which is under filters, it adds a really, really subtle outline, but it makes a pretty big difference on your exports. It might even be hard to see there, but it's really helpful to have very, very slight outlines on renderings in my opinion, so, okay. So that's kind of what I'll add. And that, remember, that's a global filter. I, I'm gonna do this per camera if I want to. I just like to set them up as close as I can right away. Um, <clears throat> so, brought in the model. What's the first thing we gotta do? We gotta apply materials to this bad boy. So, on, in, um, in Twin Motion, materials are pretty easy to use. I'm gonna try and use as many stock materials as I can. Maybe I'll apply one custom one just so you guys can see what it is. But um, if you hit T on your keyboard, it actually pulls up your eyedropper and your eyedropper is going to, if you click a material, you can see um, it's right down here, new grass. This is one of the ones that I created. If I click over here, it says sight grass. If I click over here, it says tree line. So if you click your eyedropper, it at least tells you what it is. Um, or if you wanted to, you could also just search for whatever material you're looking for. So if I'm looking for grass, again, let me move my head. Sorry about that, guys. I oh, know. 
I think I just moved the entire screen on you guys, so sorry. Let me make this fit. There we go. I'm gonna move my head now over here. <laughs> Floating heads all over the place, all right. Sweet. Okay, so another thing you can do is you could you could grab you could grab materials and as you drag around, you're kind of seeing where, they, where they're gonna go. Um, one thing I will mention, and I don't wanna to get too far into this because we only have a short amount of time, is that there is a difference. If you see down here, it says replace material. Um, there is a difference between replacing a material and applying to an object. So depending on your project, you will wanna choose one or the other. Um, so for the sake of getting this thing um, done quickly, I'm gonna use replace material. But what I will warn you um, with is when you replace a material. So let's say I replace grass five for um, down here, which is my one grass. And then if I was to right now replace this grass with the same grass five, those two materials and those two surfaces will always be the same material in twin motion once you do that. Um, so there's two ways around it. It's either you take grass five, you duplicate it and you rename it kind of like du double duplicating in, um, in um, Revit or you do apply over here, apply to objects instead of um, replace object. So uh, just a heads up, I, for the sake of time and speed, I'm gonna leave this as replace material. And uh, I don't even remember which one I picked here. Which one was this? This was grass five. So that's grass five. Another another thing to note with, with Revit is that the scale of materials is usually gonna be pretty off. So you notice I had to go up to 10 until it started looking correctly. Um, you may even need to go higher, which I'll show you soon because we're gonna need that. So for the sake of argument, I'm gonna actually throw in different grasses here. So we did grass five. I'm gonna use grass... Uh, um, four for this grassy area back here, which again is gonna be um, more in the background. And then I'm gonna use grassy ground for where my trees are gonna be. And so you can see here's my trees here, and I'm gonna crank up the scale. And so now you can kind of see what I'm doing here. I'm just filling in, filling in materials. <clears throat> so now the driveway. So if I want, let me check out some asphalt materials. You can see there's a bunch of asphalt materials. And again, I'm just searching through real quick. I'm gonna dump asphalt onto here. Let's see how this looks. So you'll notice it looks pretty good because there's something called grunge in twin motion. But if I scale this up, you'll see that you're actually not seeing much of the texture yet. Um, so it did a pretty good job with scale here, but you may, in certain materials and certain objects, you may have to scale this thing up beyond 10, okay? So this is an example, but let's say it was. A little tip from twin motion, for whatever reason, you get, you can it defaults from zero to ten, but if I wanted to type in twenty five and press enter, I can scale it to twenty five. Don't know how you change that threshold, but it is what it is. So just so you know, you aren't limited to what uh, Twin Motion lets you slide to. Um, you can actually type in a number. So that that looks pretty good for asphalt. I'm okay with that. Maybe give it a little reflection just for fun. We have this walkway right here. Um, so I'm gonna look through some of these materials. I think ground has some good ones. Um, so you can see man-made in nature, or, or natural, nature, whatever. And you can see they have different cobblestones and some really cool uh, looking grounds here. I think there's a field stone that, yeah, this stone flooring right here is kind of cool as well as this one. So I'm going to apply a stone flooring. And this is another example. Notice the scale of this thing. It doesn't look terrible, but, you know, we actually want it more like that. And so that's 10. But if we wanted it bigger, I can actually click in here and say 15, enter. But notice when I use the slider, I can't go above 10. <laughs> Don't know why. God only knows, but if you guys ran into that, that should be pretty helpful. And then if I look at a material like this, the one thing I might want to do is maybe I want to turn reflection up a little bit just to try and get a little more, um, a little more uh, bump out of it using reflection. Grunge, grunge helps a little bit um, with with the bump maps as well. And then if I go under settings, you can see bump is already maxed out with with 100%. One thing Twin Motion does not have is um, displacements, and so. Um, you may run into areas where you're thinking I'm not getting enough, I'm not getting quite enough bump as I want. And so that's just something that exists and uh, there's ways around it, but for the most part, that's what you're gonna run into. Okay, so for the most part, let's look around here. The site materials are looking pretty good. And don't worry, we're gonna add some details like vegetation and stuff too. But let's just quickly do the house. So house is pretty straightforward. Um, we're gonna look to see what kind of siding materials they have on here. Oops, let me back out of here. 
siding. So we have a wood siding, we have plastic siding. Um, so I'm just going to use the wood siding that's already here. Um, if you wanted to use your own, you could, but and I'm going to scale it up a little bit. There we go. I might change your color scheme a little bit, Mike, just because why not? <laughs> the scene's looking a little warm. I guess my sun settings, I probably have that should mess with the time a little bit, but that's okay. Um, so here's a nice little material there. I'm just looking around to make sure this looks pretty good. <clears throat> the roof, let's do some roof. So I'm going to look at some metals. Or better yet, you know, this material doesn't look all that bad. And sometimes what I'll do is um, uh, modify, let's say, you know, maybe this came in as a darker black. Um, but I can actually just take this default material that came in from Revit. And if I wanted to, I could give it uh, a little bit darker value. Maybe I up the reflection a little bit. Oops, sorry, I'm going a little fast there. Um, and then I could also up the grunge a little bit, which is kind of nice on these metals. And you can see it's already kind of making this sort of patinaed look um to the uh to the standing seam so yeah i could use a metal um but i'm just showing you some options that you have um you know bump i'm not really sure what bump map it's grabbing <laughs> but uh, i'll also add a little metallic and so there's a darker metal roof so that's not too bad just something that you could do and if i want to take the same material i can just drag it out now and apply it to the ribs so now we're starting to get something that looks a little nice there. We're getting some materials filled in. Uh, concrete's got to get done. So if I click here, you can see this is our default concrete cast in place gray from Revit. Um, so I'm actually going to, um, what you'll notice is that if I wanted to, for example, I can scale this up. <clears throat> I can add a little reflection, maybe add a little bump to it. Um, and even a little grunginess. And in theory, I could use this and it'd probably work as, as, as concrete. Um, but in my experience, um, even with Twin Motion, or sorry, even with Lumion and Twin Motion, um, you're always kind of better off using um, using their materials as a start. It just seems to help. Um, so what I'm going to do is go in and I'm going to use bare concrete. Let's see, do you want to have some fun with it? No, let's just use bare concrete too. So this is an example where uh, it's a little hard to see there, but there's the scale. So notice the scale came in, it was basically that small. Um, so by cranking it up a little bit, I can start getting something a little closer to what I want. Maybe I'll add a little more grunge to it. There we go. I'm getting a little bit of exposure. Let me jump back and, cause that's kind of bothering me, the lighting. I don't know if it's the time. Yeah, I did a. There we go. It was just a little, uh, the lighting was a little off there. I don't. There we go. Again, I like to try and get my um, my working view as close to what I'm going to use my... Uh, maybe I don't want to do summer. Maybe I want to go a little more folly. Yeah, let's do something like that. Uh, the one thing I'm going to do is I'm going to turn off that filter that I'm using right now just because I'm not a fan of how it's looking. So I'm going to go down to uh, filters, color grading. I'm going to turn off that DT7 just so I get rid of that warming effect. All right, that's better. Okay, so we've changed quite a few things. Now we just need to change the trim material. Uh, we'll change the stone around the corner here. And there's a couple wood materials, I believe, right in the corner there. So let's do the trim. Um, I don't know what color to do here. I was kind of, I wasn't really planning on doing a brown house. Um, I don't know, someone someone give me a color for trim in the chat while I'm, uh, I'm applying the stone over here. I know we got a lot of designers out there. Come on now. All right, so um, while, while you're doing that, I'm going to throw some stone on this fireplace. I'm going to like this stone wall three. It's kind of nice. And again, remember the scale thing? Uh, this is kind of how it's scaled coming in from Revit. Um, it's just an issue with, with Revit's import and the FBX. And so you're almost always going to be scaling your materials up. Usually 10 gets you somewhere, but I'll do 15. Um, oops, and I'll click off of it. 15. Okay. And I'll crank up the bump. Oh, yeah, there we go. Cool. Mocha, blue, dark bronze. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> you guys are out of control. Neon orange. I mean, I want to make an image that's presentable after this. Come on, guys. I like mocha. I think mocha might, mocha might look pretty good. Like a dark, 
like a dark walnut type of look maybe. Yeah, let's go for it, see how it looks. We can always change it afterwards. This will actually be a good example to show you how when you use replace material versus, um, versus apply. So uh, right now, if you look at this material setup, um, if I click T and I select this, there's one called Trim Alabaster. If I click this, there's Aluminum Marvin. If I click this, there's another Aluminum Marvin, so that's some kind of Marvin window, Aluminum. If I click here, it's Trim Sierra. If I click here, it's White Alabaster. If I click here, it's Trim Color. So um, if you're the one building this model, um, if you want those to all be the same material, you're better off doing them. But what you'll see is that what I can do is um, I can actually drag, once I replace these materials, all the trim materials that I want to be the same material will be the same material and modifiable that way. So that's pretty cool um, if you want it to be, but you just have to be very wary of it. So let me just dig down to wood. Uh, let's see. We got to have something without a... You know, this this could be a good opportunity to do a custom material. So um, I'm trying to find something that doesn't have chestnut, mahogany. Hmm, hmm. Let's do this olive. It's kind of a nice material. That's not terrible. So I just applied it to this one material here, which is, um, I think this was called Trim Sierra or something like that. And so you can see, whoa, we got some CMU over here. Hey, <laughs> look at that. We're going to have to change that, huh? By the way, if you are using Twin Motion, if you press the number one on your keyboard, it slows your movement down. Number two speeds it up, and then number three speeds it up even more. So I, I'm, I'm apologizing if I'm moving around a little too fast, but I just wasn't flipping too much. So I'm going to take this concrete, and I'm actually going to flip the CMU to concrete. Looks like a reverse model there, which is pretty cool. Um, I'm also going to select this insulation rigid, and this is what's kind of cool about Twin Motion too, is because we brought it in by material. If I expand my FBX export, I can actually select um, my insulation rigid, which you can see is right here, and I can actually control the visibility of it. I can turn it off, so I can turn every element off that has the rigid insulation. Maybe you don't want to do that, but for the sake of this rendering, I'm going to hide the rigid insulation because it was popping up above grade. So you can actually manually control. Um, um, you can manually control the the layers based on sorry the, the components based on their materials, which is kind of cool. All right, so uh, let's see. So we got this nice material here, this olive, and so if I flip this into the inside, maybe it's maybe it's going to be too much to do the trims that dark color. Hmm. Hmm. That's all right. Let's just roll with it. So what I'm doing is I'm just I'm using T to select them and I'm going to place them uh, place the material within it. Uh, it looks like the inside is actually uh, another material, so it looks like it's a Marvin with an aluminum frame and a wood outside. For the sake of this uh, rendering, I want it to be the same because why not? <laughs> oh, the dark's not that bad. I could live with it. Um, so you can see what I'm doing is I'm actually flipping all this stuff out. But now because I flipped it out, if I went to T and I selected here. You notice they're all, they're all olive two now, so now they're all the same material, and so I can modify olive two, and they will all change. So I can make it darker, lighter, add more to it, etc. So that's kind of cool if that's what you're going for. Maybe in here we'll do something a little fun. We'll do uh, I don't know. We'll do a darker siding in here. Ooh, I should probably do. So this is a good example. So this you notice this right here is wood siding one. So what I may want to do is actually use an apply material or um, rename wood siding one. So if I go to T, I click here. I'm going to rename this guy wood siding, I don't know, entire house or something like that. So now when I place the other wood siding, it's not going to over overlap it. See how they're both different materials now? And now here I'll rename this. And this is that whole replace object thing. When you do it a few times, you'll get used to it. But it's one of those things like not double duplicating assets in Revit that kicks your butt. Um, and let's do, maybe we'll do a thinner siding. We'll do a maybe darker or something like that. I don't know, something different. Kind of like a louver. Oh, it looks like we had the same material here. That's unfortunate. Let's undo. Another great thing, we do have undo. So another uh, sort of unfortunate thing here is that trim color, trim color, trim color, uh, all these objects are the same. So there's a couple things I can do. I can deal with that and just change and, and go with it, or I can actually just change it in Revit and flip it back in. So 
I dare do this during a live model? I do. Let's go with it. <clears throat> so here's my, my wood timber columns, which looks like I have multiple types, which is always great. So let me, uh, let me change these types, and I'm going to change the material of these columns to column material, because I don't want those to be the same as the trim color. Actually, you know what? Those make more sense as trim color. This little thing in here, I might want to change. Let's see how this was modeled. Mike, you asked for it. <laughs> All right. So it looks like we have a wall here, which has trim color applied to it. Look at that wall, huh? I think it's got reveals for days. Let's see. Oh, yeah. Here we go. This is my favorite part about using other people's models. So here's the wall that he created, which is pretty cool. And then it looks like he sliced and diced this thing to the God's end here, uh, adding some reveals and whatnot. And I'm gonna check to see if this is a paint. So <clears throat> I'm gonna go to remove paint and I'm gonna hover. Rabbit 2020 is gonna kick my butt right now. I don't know about you guys, but Rabbit 2020, and I'm on 2020.2, I'm still getting some like five minutes of not able to click anything and then it comes back to me. It looks like we're stuck in that. Oh yeah. PT? No. All right, we'll jump back to that siding then for now. So what I want to do is I'm going to change the material of that inside. So let's just check some other materials, see what we have here. Um, we have white alabaster, that color there, which I think is being used a few different locations here. Um, so I think for that, what we're going to want to do is maybe just use our olive G2, but I think I'm actually going to um, duplicate it and rename it olive darker. Maybe I want to make that a little darker. I'm going to apply that to uh, the trims here, and I'm going to darken that up. Why? Because, again, why not? So now we got a few browns. This is going to be a pretty dark building, huh? wasn't really ready for that. Okay, so we've got, con and, and this, uh, now that everything's dark like this, this concrete is driving me nuts. I don't know about you guys, but I'm gonna change this. Maybe this wants to be stone. In fact, I think this wants to be the same stone as the fireplace. So I'm just gonna take the stone from the fireplace and I'm gonna drop it over the concrete there. Ooh, that's really big. Scale it down a little bit. Ah, much better, much better. Um, all these materials, I, I, I'm, I again, I'm trying to, Trying to sort of read both here. Um, all these uh, all these materials are right now default in Twin Motion. Um, I would uh, you can apply your own materials too, but what I'm searching through right now come baked within Twin Motion 2020. So um, right here we got cherry for the door and all this good stuff for the door. Um, looks like I can't change the door material separate from the frame, so we're not going to bother with that. But we could also do a little metal on the front. Uh, let's do. Metal, maybe we'll do some worn. Oh, that carbon might've been nice on the uh, on the handle there, or on the uh, top there. Let's do a worn copper. Sure, why not? Okay, I'm gonna go back to Revit to see if it wants to cooperate now. Modify, no, it doesn't wanna cooperate. All right, oh wait, there we go. Okay, so another little trick, and this is one from another tutorial years and years ago. Um, oh, look at that, my head is floating. <laughs> Again, it's just, my head's just popping up everywhere. Um, if you use the paint, if you select remove or add paint, if you hover over a surface, it's actually gonna tell you what it's painted by. Um, so you can see I'm hovering over it. It says um, wall basic material, ba 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 ba, and it says painted with trim color. So what I'm gonna do is I'm actually going to paint it with a a, uh, a new material. So I guess I should make the new material first. I, I told myself I wasn't gonna do any Revit modifications during this live thing, but here we are. Um, inner window detail. If I want to, I can apply appearance to it and whatnot, but honestly, it doesn't really matter because I'm doing it in twin motion. So now I'm gonna go to modify, I'm gonna go to paint. Oh, paint's way over here, because I was on another monitor. I'm sure you guys can all 
relate to that. And then I'm gonna paint this with that lovely gray that I just created. But this is a good example because I can show you how loading this back in can uh, either destroy you or make your life amazing. So I'm gonna go to export. There's my twin motion export away over here again because that's what Revit likes to do when you have multiple monitors. I'm going to overwrite my existing one. So I'm gonna overwrite this guy, click save, yes. So I'm just re-exporting now. Cheers, Jason, welcome. <clears throat> Export successful, lovely, that's what I like to see. Jump back in twin motion, hop over to my imports, hit the refresh and hope to God that all my materials stay. Ta-da, they stayed, thank God. So when you use apply versus replace, a lot of times that's when you run into the issues with material staying. Um, and some of the visibility things will, will not go away. So in, the ridge insulation turned back on. But you'll notice now these are gray and these are the trim material, which is kind of what I wanted, right? So now that I wanted this guy here, I can take that, um, I can take that uh, siding material that I wanted to do. Wood siding. I can apply it here. I'm gonna rename it as well. I'm gonna call it inset. And I'm just gonna make this a darker siding that's a little bit smaller than the other one. Maybe even darker than that, why not? Something like that. I'm gonna turn up reflection. I'm gonna turn up grunge a little bit. Maybe it's some kind of like weird metal thing. Well, that looks kind of cool. Okay, um, quick question I saw by Neil is why not use the live link from Revit because I just hate live links from Revit for these programs. <laughs> no, I, <clears throat> it, it works, um, same with Lumion. But um, I like the idea of when I'm doing something like this, um, memorializing that Revit model at that moment in time, exporting it and making the scene, and then only when I want to, um, relinking it and resaving it. Um, live link, if you start you know, doing some major model edits and stuff like that, you can run into some major issues. So that's why I don't choose to use the live links. You guys are more than welcome to use live links if you'd like. This little strip of white down here is really bothering me. So I'm just gonna add some more brick to that. And then last but not least, I think we just have this trim color here, which is these columns. And I guess we might as well just use this dark color because I don't feel like being super creative tonight. And last but not least, uh, let's do a nice little uh, walkway here or our, our patio thing. Scale it up a little bit, uh, crank open here. Add a little grunge. All right, I think we got most of the materials. Ooh, what's that thing? Let's change this thing up here. If you want to, um, you can do some materials on the inside if, if you must. Um, the only other thing that you might wanna change is um, the glass. So the glass does come in and it works, but for the sake of renderings um, in, in um, twin motion, we do have something called reflective glass and um, I would suggest you uh, you utilize that. It, it helps and I'll show you why when, when we do the rendering, um, but it will help with um, with your reflections during rendering and in general, it just makes a better looking scene. I always put a little bit of a, of a blue or purple hint, tint to my glass, depending on what it is. So there we go, we got a scene starting to go. Perfect, save as so we don't forget anything. All right, let's roll. So now I'm gonna place vegetation. I'm gonna, another great thing about Twin Motion is you can add uh, containers, which are folders for your visibility. And I'm gonna add from, a con from my context, I'm gonna add trees. I'm gonna add single trees. I'm gonna add um, grass. And this all depends on how you wanna modify it, but I always like having uh, the ability to turn on and off things like that. So people, so I have trees, single trees, grass, and people. And then I'm gonna set trees as my active container. So these are gonna be my, my large large place trees. So here's where this awesome um, uh, vegetation scatter comes into play. I'm gonna flip over to context. I'm gonna to go to vegetation scatter. I'm gonna to go to trees. And I'm gonna use a horse chestnut, a sweet birch, a pecan, or European beech, and let's use a Norway spruce. So now I can place these are five tree types. I, I dropped them in here. I'm selecting them. And notice there's a little plus sign right here. Well, if I click that little plus sign, it's kind of like a paint bucket fill in Photoshop, but for 3D trees. So if I click this material, you'll notice it actually places trees 
randomly um, throughout that one material. Now you see why I did subregions. Click it one more time, does a few more. Click it one more time, does a few more. That's probably enough because what we're gonna do now is once we place these trees, I have the ability to modify their settings. So if I go and I select them again, I go to settings, you'll notice I can actually change the age of these trees. So I can make them taller, I can turn growth on, I can turn seasons on, or I can make them always be in fall. But now you can see within just two clicks, look at that awesome forest I got. Pretty freaking cool. And so that's why the subregions are really important because now I'm able to place that, but I, I can manually place the trees I want around the site. So let me turn to three, zoom in here. Whoa, 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 whoa. I sped up a little too much there. So now before I place, uh, before I do the grass, I'm gonna place trees uh, with a little more control. So I got my big forest in. Now I'm actually gonna use, um, using in, in the same trees area, I'm gonna utilize what's called a vegetation paint. So this acts a similar way where you place one, two, three, let's do, I'm not gonna do the spruce for this one, because why not? <clears throat> so now if I go in here and I select these three trees, I can click paint and I can actually draw these trees on. Oh boy, hello. Got a little click happy there. Let's try that again. Okay, so now I can paint. I can set my diameter to whatever I want. And actually, I can actually paint the rest of my forest in here. So we're only gonna be paying attention to a scene or two. So I'm actually going to sort of clean it up a little bit like this. Um, what I like to do, and the reason I have these sort of single trees that you're taught, that, that this other layer, is um, I like to uh, be able to place some single trees for shadows and stuff like that. All right, and what's really cool about it is these guys um, are completely controllable via these layers over here. So if I turn off scatter tree, you can see I can turn off the scattered vegetation, I could turn off the painted vegetation, or using this container, I could actually turn off all the trees. Super cool um, and super powerful, right? So for net, right now, I'm gonna leave that as our trees. Um, what I'll do is once we create our, our image, I might want to place a couple trees behind me or something to make some nice shadows across it. So now let's go to grass. So I'm going to set my grass of my, as my active container. I'm going to go to vegetation scatter. I'm going to choose, just for fun, I'm going to choose three different grasses. I'm going to do long grass one, long grass two, and long grass three. Someone didn't mow their lawn. I'm going to click scatter at, uh, add, and you'll notice just by clicking this material, remember I did these by subregion, it's adding realistic grass to my scene. And it's three different types, which is pretty cool. Okay. <clears throat> and notice I can turn this on and off. So now if I select these three, I can go under settings and I can do things like change the size of it, you know, up and down. I can change the tint, the dryness, and some really cool settings. But for the sake of time, we're gonna say this is, looks great. Okay, one more thing that I didn't add <clears throat> is uh, I'll do new container and I'll do shrubs or something like that. So of course we're gonna need we're gonna need some bushes and trees around the house. So for these I'm just gonna manually manually select them. So I'm gonna go through trees and maybe I'll do a um, maybe I'll do a nice little let's see apricot tree. Sure. Maybe I'll do an apricot tree here and maybe one here and maybe one here. And these individual trees, um, I can also change the individual sizes of each of them using growth. Um, and you can see, you know, different different heights there. And then maybe I'll add a couple bushes in front of the scene too. What we got on time? Oh, 820, oh boy. I started about 10 minutes late, right? So, <laughs> all right, so uh, I'm gonna add some box bushes around here too. I am not a landscape architect, so please don't kill me for where I'm placing these, but I'm just gonna add some things to the scene so you guys get a sense of how this could work. Um, maybe I'll add one here and here as well. Sure. I'm sure some flowers and stuff would be nice, but uh, again, I could be here all day doing that. So uh, I'll only add, maybe I'll add a couple, some flowers over here in the corner just for fun, get a little color in there. Perfect. Okay, now I'm gonna go and I'm gonna use my people. I'm gonna say set as active container. And the reason I'm doing this is it's always easier to, to place things and leave them 
uh, or, and place them in their container when you're doing the individual. Otherwise, you're going to have a list like this that you have to select everything and place them in the container afterwards. So let's place some people. So I'm going to add, hmm, who should we add? Let's add. Uh, we'll add someone on the porch. So maybe who looks like she'll be on a porch. Uh, there's too many people to choose from. <clears throat> Whoa. Sorry about that, everyone. We just went through the ground and through the forest. And now we are somewhere behind the house. There we go. I'm sure it's great following along when you're not controlled. It's like driving. I can't be. I can't be next to someone or in the driver's seat sometimes. All right, let's make sure she doesn't walk off the porch. So I'm going to take a look at how her animation is. Um, we might want to watch have her watching. So you can use still people, but for the sake, just because it's kind of fun, I'm going to make her walking. And she's walking into a column, dandy. Let's move her to the side a little bit. OK, so she's walking around on the cell phone and maybe we'll have some kids playing in the yard. So <clears throat> Isabel will be here and Ryan will be right here. Perfect. And they look bored in the yard. I guess everyone's on quarantine. OK, so we'll have them looking at each other make the scene a little realistic. And so what's pretty cool is you'll notice just by adding these, I don't know why Ryan doesn't want to rotate. Come on, Ryan, rotate. There we go. Wow, they look really bored. So what's pretty cool about these is you can actually, um, you can change what their animations are. So you could see he's he could be drinking water, he could be idle, he could be sitting, um, he could be dancing, uh, he could be speaking. You know, so you can actually change the animated characters to do different things, which is pretty cool. And so they're just playing a game. So we got some people there. And last but not least, I'll add a car and then we'll pump out a rendering. Let's put a car in the driveway. We'll put this little uh, Hyundai looking thing. One thing you will notice with with placement on Revit topography is uh, Twinmotion has no idea what to do with it. So see how it's doing this crazy stuff. So I'm just gonna place it and then rotate it afterwards. It's unfortunate, but it uh, it tries to use Unreal's uh, physics engine to figure it out. And uh, I guess with Revit content, it has no idea what to do with it. We also never change the garage, but that's okay. It's not gonna be in our scene. Another little tip is if you tab around this selection portal, it lets you do things like scale, rotate, uh, move. So if you want to rotate the pitch or move it up and stuff, you can press tab and it goes through that. All right, we got ourselves a scene. You know what? One last thing we should do just for fun is uh, we should add a little smoke coming out of the chimney because why not? So I'm going to go down to user library. Um, try to remember where the heck the smoke is. I guess I could just search for it. It's under particles somewhere. And I do see your comments. I'm reading some of them. Um, let me see. Any tips for Enscape Entourage? Um, the tips for Enscape Entourage is good luck. Um, so I, I'm. you guys have seen my information, and I do. I love Enscape, and I use it. Um, oh, look at that. That's some serious, uh, serious smoke there. Cool. Um, but placing Entourage right now inside of the Revit environment, if you were to place like all those trees and stuff, um, for those of you familiar with it, you'd probably know that it's an absolute, um, and yes, chimney smoke in a summer scene. Um, if they're up here in New England and in Connecticut, then, uh, you can use a fire year round because it's freaking cold as hell. <laughs> even, in, even at the, uh, even at, uh, in the summer at nighttime. Um. <clears throat> or maybe they have a boiler that's just uh, burning really, really dirty. <laughs> okay, so the last thing we want to do before we, we create a rendering, and this is just because I want you guys to, to see a little tip there. Um, when it comes to creating true, accurate um, reflections, um, you will get some nice reflections in this scene just because you're using reflective glass. But um, Twin Motion, because it's a, a, a um, an Unreal Engine type of thing, um, if you want real reflections, it's kind of like in, in Lumion, you had the place reflection planes and stuff. You have to use what's called a reflection probe. 
And so we're only doing one scene, so I'm just gonna place the reflection probe in front of our house. And uh, what the reflection probe is gonna do, and I'm, I have a post that I'm gonna write about uh, just explaining the reflection probe because it, it can take all day to explain. But basically what you want it to do is you want it to be the size of the one facade that you're rendering at this time, or in general, if you're doing all four facades, um, you want it to be the size, oh geez, uh, the size of facades. And what's gonna happen is whatever's inside this box is gonna reflect off of the um, the glass that, that's, uh, it's gonna reflect correctly, I should say. So notice how I'm increasing it a little bit. So if I increase it, and then I bring it just to the face of this guy, it's gonna reflect all the trees behind me. And so I'm gonna get into a camera view and show you. I probably shouldn't have put that under people too, so let me pull that out of people. There we go. So now I place that and I'll show you exactly what it does in a second. Now I'm gonna go down to my images. I'm gonna scroll down and get to a view that I wanna create a rendering of. So let us do Oh, that's a pretty nice looking view. Uh, something like this. So create image. So now I've created myself a little scene. And for the sake of the fact that we're in twin motion and we can do this, let's do uh, a nice little elevation rendering too, just for fun. Actually, we should set up the scene first. So here's our scene. <clears throat> what I wanted to show you is, it may be hard to see, but if you look at these windows, try and look at like this little window here and this little window here. If I turn off that reflection probe, notice what happens. You don't see the reflection of the trees. It's gonna reflect the world for the sake of computer speed, right? So you need a reflection probe in order to actually reflect truly your environment. So definitely take, take advantage of those. Uh, so now we have an image here. What I'm gonna do is I'm actually going to set the, um, the sun settings a little different here because what I really want is I do want some more tree shadows in my scene. So I'm going to do something like this. Uh, maybe, ooh, there we go. A little pro tip for rendering for everyone. The more shadows that you have from behind you and stuff, the more realistic the scene ends up looking. Just uh, one of those things. So, uh, so you can see just in general already the scene's starting to look a little more realistic. So now I got some shadow settings that I like. Now I can go through and I can set my lighting settings just for this particular scene, right? So maybe I want the exposure to be up a little bit. Um, this is where I like to use shadows. So um, if you notice, if I crank shadows down, you're gonna get a different result. If you crank shadows up, you're gonna get a different result. Ideally, you want the shadow distance to be generally within your scene. Um, and the way I figure out the scene now, the scene distance, is um, if I go under, uh, if I turn on depth of field, I can actually click um, a target now in 2020. And if I click it, uh, you could see it's actually giving me 83 feet. So that's a quick way to know where your building is in relation to your camera. And then I use that 83 feet to judge my shadows. So if I go under lighting, I can crank shadows down to 83 feet as sort of a start. So let me just do 83. And you can see that's kind of where my building is. And so then you can crank up shadows more. I would, I would urge you from not going all the way up because you'll see what it does is it actually decreases the detail of the shadow to close objects. So really your shadow distance wants to be as far as you can make it where you're not losing shadow detail. And I know it's kind of annoying and confusing, but you'll get a sense of it when you start playing around with it. Same thing with shadow bias. Usually 0.2 is okay. 0.1 is probably the most that you want to go down. Um, ambient lighting, I'm going to turn that up a little bit to crank up the shadows a little bit. Um, as I'm looking at this scene, I may want to quickly uh, fill in some, some um, shrubbery down here. Um, I'm, I'm not gonna get that picky about it today, but usually what I'll do is I'll fill in more shrubbery down in the bottom, but for the sake of argument, we got something going here. Uh, let me just check some of my camera settings. I'm gonna turn on parallelism because we wanna make sure those lines are nice and straight. We're all architects or uh, designers around here. Why not? You have vignetting, you have a couple other things. Um, under visual effects, this is where you can check things like your contrast and your saturation. Uh, in my opinion, again, this is opinion, but higher contrast, lower saturation usually looks more realistic. And then if you wanna start using some visual filters, you can, but I kinda like the way this is. So here's image one. So uh, there's image one. And what's cool about this is if I go over here and let's say this is my next view that I wanna do. So maybe it's something like this. If 
I create image two, you can see it, it takes the same settings. And so if I zoom in a little, maybe I'll do something like this. And I click image three. The only thing you're gonna to wanna to do as you get closer and you move around is you're going to want to change your depth of field. So for this particular image, I need to change my depth of field distance so it's nice and crisp. Same thing on the other one. So now you can see I've got these three images good to go. <clears throat> Look at that, just about an hour. And I talked for about five, 10 minutes in the beginning. So just about an hour. Now we can make renderings. So two ways to make renderings. And this is an interesting point. And I'm actually, I do have a blog post about this too coming up because it's fascinating to me. So under export, I can select my three images and it says multi here. Um, I'm gonna save it because you never know. Um, you have the ability to turn on what's called refinement, which is just gonna be a higher, higher rate of um, rendering when it actually renders. Uh, and then max lighting on. So that's sort of cranking everything up. The one thing I didn't mention either was if you want to control the size of your images, um, you have to do it within the camera views. So under format, you can see right now I'm just doing 1080 images, which is fine for what we're doing here. I'm going to click start export, throw them on my desktop, and now we're rendering. And so this is three images at 1080, um, <clears throat> and this is sort of the rendered piece. So the last thing I want to show you is once this finishes, if it finishes, <laughs> let's hope it does, um, the... Uh, you can also you can also render quote unquote using the uh, presentation mode, and I actually found that it looks very similar, if not better, depending on your situation. Um, so you can see it's pumping out these images. Um, the reason it's taking a little longer than you may be used to is because I turned on the high refinement and I also turned on uh, max lighting and reflections. Um, so uh, we're getting there, almost there. Uh, while it's going, I'm going to read a few things. Looks like there was a. Hopefully you guys were all just looking in awe <laughs> of Twin Motion, how cool it is. But it looks like um, any tips for Enscape Entourage. Um, my computer setup, Angelo, is the uh, I'm using the Origin. So um, if you check out on the blog or on the uh, YouTube channel, I reviewed this Origin. This is the Evo 16S or uh, 16S, yeah, I think 16S. I did a full review on it, um, and I just have two monitors hooked up to it, so I have two 1080s hooked up to it. So there you go, it's done rendering. Um, what I want to do is I'm going to make, I'm actually going to make a present presenter mode. And this is what I'm going to write a blog post about because I think it's super interesting. So if I create a new presenter mode, which is kind of like this PowerPoint EXE thing that exists inside Twin Motion now, it used to be called BIM Motion in, in previous versions. I can add my images to uh, a presentation. Okay, so these are, these are basically slides now within a presentation. But what I can do is I can export this as a .exe or... I can um, I can go into presenter mode. Oops, and it just went on the other monitor. Of course it did. Hmm. It, it's going to the main monitor. Sorry, guys. Uh, should I try and flip that? <clears throat> Let's see. Oh, this is going to be wild. So if you guys are really interested in this... Uh, I'm going to set up. Okay. I guess it's not going to let me see. It's flipping onto the main monitor when I go to presentation mode. Um, so I guess I can't show you that. But long story short, you'll see a blog post about it. And, um, and you can actually export from the presenter mode. But now, go see my, my boy Jacob. I'm gonna go back to camera. And uh, yeah, so that's the rendering. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna open them right now and show you what we just created. Screen and camera, now let's do screen only. Alrighty. So there we go, so there's one rendering, there's another rendering, and there's another rendering. So, pretty cool, um, you know, I would suggest that you you, you Photoshop these. Um, I'll flip through them again. And this was again under an hour, just about an hour, uh, using someone else's model. So I think it's pretty cool, pretty powerful. <clears throat> and um, obviously you'd wanna Photoshop these. I would suggest you do some sort of Photoshop um, stuff. And maybe uh, if you're interested, maybe next week I'll do some, some post-production stuff of these images or something like that. But um, all right. <laughs> I didn't even get to drink my drink during that whole thing. 
Uh, I'm just checking out some of the questions and stuff. Um, uh, somebody's asking about the exporter. So yeah, it's an e, it, uh, BIM Motion. Uh, I wish I could show you, but I, I don't. Um, I need to set up a. It's it's opening on my other m monitor, and I, if I flip OSB, which is what I'm broadcasting on, it's just gonna be a nightmare for you guys. Um, so I could always talk about that later, but definitely you can look it up, um, the presenter, and um, it's pretty cool. But yeah, it exports an EXE, and uh, you can run that EXE, but you can also run it in the editor, which is what I was going to show you. And uh, from there, you can actually um, from there you can actually export um, screenshots, but they look very similar to renderings. Um, somebody said, "The uh, please do post production next time." So maybe I will. Maybe next week I'll, I'll run through some of that stuff. Um, I'm just reading through some of your questions. Uh, great stuff. Super fast. So, uh, yeah. Wow. So I think I did it. Uh, maybe I'll look back in the timer to see if I did it an hour. But, um, <laughs> Mike, thank you so much for submitting your model. Um, I want to thank everyone for joining me. Um, Anything new with Twin Motion twenty twenty point one point one? I didn't know there was a point twenty twenty point one point one out. What am I on twenty point one? God, I hope they fix some of the some of the crashes. Luckily, we didn't run into any crashes. But honestly, the crashes that are happening for me are on um, really large models, like uh, twelve gigabyte scenes. Like those are pretty you know massive forty acre sites. So um, so yeah. I'll take a look at 2020.1.1 though, because I'm interested in it too. Um, Randy asked how much the twin motion cost. Um, I believe if you sign up for Unreal right now, it's free um, for now. Uh, or if you had an Unreal account, it's free. I don't remember how it is. But I think that the total cost right now is, is I think they're doing a 50% the yearly professional license. So it's like 250 bucks for the year or something like that. Um, it's actually relatively inexpensive. You can check it out on, uh, if you just search for twin motion, or um, Epic Games, um, I believe. So I'm actually using it free because I had an Unreal uh, Epic Games account beforehand. Um, but definitely check it out. And um, <clears throat> I think what you guys have saw um, is, is that the Twin Motion UI is pretty easy to use. And in conclusion, I think you can see that um, I, I took a, a model that I didn't even create, that Mike created, and was able to mo turn it into a rendering um, a usable rendering that again with a little bit of post-production could look mint um which I'll, I'll whether i whether i show you in a video or whether i do it for the post i don't know but um pretty cool pretty powerful stuff um trial is full version sorry i'm just reading some stuff cool i hope you guys enjoyed this i i i, I had fun i didn't i wasn't i was a little a little worried that i wasn't gonna get it done in time but um, if you don't have any other questions and stuff, I want, I'm going to hop off. Um, I hope this was valuable. I hope this was useful. If you enjoyed this, please again, subscribe. I want to hit 30,000 subscribers. That'd be super cool. And, uh, definitely if you're interested in, uh, becoming a beta member of my, uh, learning community of Revit and, and all things BIM, um, head on over to, um, uh, BIM, BIMAfterDarkBeta.com. I'll post it in here again. And the replay of this will be on YouTube live as well as on my blog at TheRevitKid.com. Um, I think I saw a question come in. Hey Jeff, um, uh, when, when you're using VR and twin motion, I can't adjust elevation. Ha, that's a great question. <laughs> so, um, what you need to do, um, so I've been testing VR for twin motion versus Enscape and I've been able to, um, get them very close as far as quality and usage. Again, the one big issue I have is that you can't physically move with a D pad. You have to use either walking in real space or using uh, the trigger. But with Twin Motion, what I noticed is you have to start put your put your camera in Twin Motion on the ground basically when you start VR, so that you, in, if your headset's on the ground, then you lift it up and it's it's correct. Um, it won't always stay that way, but that's what I found out. And um, I think it has to do with something with your level trying to set where your zero is in the Twin Motion world versus Revit. I think is something that I've run into. So. The one thing that I, the one thing that I did that worked for me was starting with your goggles on the floor and making sure your camera in twin motion, so the view you're looking at was you sitting on the floor basically if you were with the goggles, and then when you start it, you can pop them up and it's good to go. So, pretty sweet. All right, looks like you guys are still chatting away, but I'm gonna head out. Um, thank you all for joining me. Um, I really appreciate it, and um, feel free to reach out if you have any other questions. And um, I'll talk to everyone later. Stay safe. Stay happy. 
And uh, yeah, have a great week.